Thanks so much, Biliana, for that. I'm Sylvia Grace Porta. I'm your second presenter, and I'll be looking today at connecting communities to the arts, climate, and the environment. Um, the materials that are presented sort of accumulate from a good decade and beyond. I'm more than happy to share this material. Please reach out to me as you can. My details are, are here. You can email me or just you know, drop a line and let's talk. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional landowners, which I'm presenting today, and to pay my respects to BC Coast Salish elders past and present and to future generations. Specifically, this talk has been presented on the unceded and traditional territories of the Coast Salish, including the territories of the Squamish, Stolo, Suela Tooth, and Musqueam Nations. So in connecting communities, we have to understand why choose art? Well, art's a really interesting sort of criteria because it allows us to be in dialogue with each other. It also allows us to have greater interconnectedness, have a capacity to speak with confidence, to understand and learn about our environment, and to become ambassadors for climate action. The other thing that's really interesting about art creation is that it helps us not only create, but evaluate, analyze, apply, understand, and remember our environment and the events in which we were participating. And so art actually is a very strong marker of remembering and evaluating our spaces in the same way that we can have those experiences in nature. And so why nature? Well, when we're present with nature, we have huge health benefits. We have this capacity to have increased empathy, positive social behavior. We are all also able to reduce our stress levels to increase positive stimulation. And in this capacity, nature acts as a, a, an, an area in which we can also become ambassadors for climate action. We can see what is present within our parks and understand what we need to preserve and move forward in a meaningful way. So when we look at why communities art and climate projects, why bring these all together? Well, if we consider these under the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and there's 18 uh, goals or 17 main goals, one's to support the biosphere, and as we move up society and economy, what we find is that art, parks, and climate all come together really brilliantly. So under the biosphere, we have this ability to facilitate climate resilience. We also have an, a, a great ability to improve awareness of nature services from air and water quality to the, to the sense of our green space. Within the society sort of tier, we're actually promoting and creating culture, we're creating positive spaces, and we're sharing knowledge. And under that as well, we're also promoting health and well-being. And in that last tier, we're developing cultural legacies, we're helping with um, regional and international engagement, art, and tourism. So communities, art and climate projects have a lot coming together when these three spaces are met and uh, addressed holistically together. In looking at how to build successful eco art projects and to undertake this idea of connecting community to arts, climate, environment, there are several steps that one needs to consider. And so this is sort of a template of what you might wanna consider um, from a parks perspective, which is, uh, particularly, what is the land challenge use? What really needs to be accomplished? Um, understanding the audience, who are the, who are the target people that, that you want to uh, engage um, with uh, the park and with potentially an invited artist or set of artists? And how can all these parties come together to co-design a set of solutions? It's also really important at that time to look forward and consider future casts, what type of engagement and partnering might be possible. So building the processes of artists and communities can also include bringing into that conversation planners, civic bodies, even other uh, stakeholders in an area, which can include universities or other uh, knowledge uh, stakeholders, indigenous groups, and how can all of these partners come together to build a legacy. In that legacy, how can that also impact and inform the artwork as well as, as the site in which this is going to happen? And lastly, um, beyond the artwork and the site being uh, treated and looked at, how can there also be a really active element of training communities um, with, through education or through engagement with students and other regional bodies 
to not only maintain care for this project or for this land work, but how can this also evolve other outcomes that can be gifted and can continue to evolve beyond the, the initial life cycle of inviting an artisan community to work within a, a given context. So these are uh, things that are uh, steps that can work in terms of how to understand what might be possible. And so what I'll walk you through is a particular community project that actually has a global story attached to it and it's called Trees for Life. So I'm one of two artists working actively on this project it involves another artist called uh, John Keith Dunnelly. And we're working across three village sites. We've been able to activate 72 uh, community participants. And within that, there is embedded six community leaders. This project has involved um, arts, horticulture, land works, and revitalizing a landscape to rehabilitate it so it can become much more climate resilient. And in some ways, allowing the community to also heal and become resilient itself. Um, this project was presented as part of COP26 Glasgow, um, the world events uh, that are looking at how we can take climate action much more seriously at the local and international level and have simple tools that can enable us to have great and meaningful impact between communities and regions. So Trees for Life, as I mentioned, um, is an arts and heart to cultural project. It is involves the establishment of a permanent community tree nursery. And it's also involved three village sites being uh, opened up to create living tree artworks. And a living tree artwork is effectively planting trees within the aesthetic arrangement. And this is just a simple step that can give new pride and be can become a point of discussion for community to see something that they've done within their own region, within their own area that now has an aesthetic arrangement and to share this initiative globally. But this initiative has been taken one step further and we can see this um, in the slide or on the image that's right here off to, to this corner. We've planted trees um, in the shape and form of significant animals and trees, but at a scale that would be appropriate for a park. So something that's quite large scale that's been outlined and it's been outlined actually to be seen by satellites. So it's actually a world, the world's first climate earth observation artwork. And what I mean by this is that we're planting trees to have this sort of shape and form that can be seen by something like Google Earth. So we've done a very simple action of asking communities to plant trees that are meaningful, to their own uh, context that can also help us monitor and understand climate that can create deep shade, can create areas to meet and to have social activities. And through those processes of planting have also become a, a social activity. And this endeavor has taken sort of a whole nine months to come across these three plantings, but it's also started to really spark this idea of imagination. And what I haven't said is, and I've left, left it sort of as a side note, is this project has been taking place through digital means, through the capacity that this conference is happening, such as Zoom, with conversations through WhatsApp, through Zoom, um, through email. And myself and fellow artist Keith Dunnelly have been actually uh, undertaking this type of work for a very remote community in rural Ethiopia. They're located in Kofela. It's a district of the West Arsi, which is the province of Oromia in Ethiopia. And so we're creating these living earth artworks that, as I say, can be tracked within about 12 months time in Google Satellite. So we're enabling communities that actually have very poor resources to actually occupy one of the most world significant data channels and that they can use it appropriately to monitor their own climate rehabilitation health. And that's really quite significant. And this is actually where the arts is a great conduit to bring communities together to do something that they may not do under a typical circumstance, but also to do something that can be quite meaningful and impactful in most unexpected ways. So in Ethiopia, there have been large projects to plant 
uh, massive areas of uh, land to rehabilitate it with trees. But this is sort of almost done like a box shop uh, or a workshop in the sense that thousands of trees are planted without that community engagement. And this is really where the arts can undertake the segue to facilitate community to engage with the conversations at hand. Um, who else has come on board? Uh, projects have to have the support of others to really help legitimize them and also to create this conduits of knowledge exchange. And so for this endeavor, it is a commission that came through COP26 and was funded by the British Council, but it was also given the support through Dundee, and this is Dundee, Scotland, and Dundee is a UNESCO city of design. And so it was really important for the city of Dundee to come on board and say it believed that design and art could be the foundations to assist in land rehabilitation, as well as offering solutions to climate change and to bring forward community engagement. And this is really important. And even though this is um, a project that's had sort of these global partners come on board, there's nothing that says we can't do this at a regional and local level um, within particularly, I'm proud to say this, my own home province of British Columbia. So the challenge is out there. If anybody wants to reach out, Trees for Life is expanding and there is a global call for participation. But the other part of the project really was showing you know, proof of concept. It's one thing to say, that we can plant trees in the shape and the form of key significant um, icons. And so in the case of this Ethiopian community, it was very important to plant um, a uh, animal, uh, the Ethiopian lion, which is um, very much a threatened species in that local area. So we have the outline of trees in the shape of an Ethiopian lion. And to have that um, really appear as it was scheduled or as was conceived as an earth observation artwork. So through our partners and through a lot of dialogue, we've been able to bring on a sub partner, which is NASA's earth observation unit. And so NASA is actually going through the International Space Station Agency to help us record these artworks before they actually appear in Google Earth. And so we're able to show, hopefully in the next two to three weeks, we'll share with the public, what do these land artworks look like? How is the community involved and share that wider story? So you're getting sort of the uh, precursor story before it breaks uh, world news. Um, and as I say, there is a global call. The most important thing about public art work that involves community is to learn the lessons of what has worked well and to share it with others. And it is that generosity that really starts to build a project that can have um, bigger building blocks that really celebrate the community and allow them to understand that they aren't alone, that the content and the context in which they participate has other applications to other communities. And it can also create impact and meaning um, in this way that it will allow others to also create their own community engaged artworks and continue this conversation and allow the project to evolve and come under different uh, sort of evolutions. So the global call has been put out for folks to participate in attempting to do a tree circle. And a tree circle can be something where it's a contrast between deciduous and coniferous trees as sort of portrayed on the left image. Or it can be something simple as planting a number of tree saplings, maybe around an area that has park benches so that it can create a more intimate social space for people to meet. Um, in whatever scale the project is happening, um, you're more than welcome to reach out because there is this possibility of getting what is accomplished in your own regional area at designation as part of this COP26 endeavor. And that is an accolade that's really important for communities to realize that they can be acknowledged as part of a larger climate dialogue. And the work that they've done to make a simple artwork can certainly constitute something that can be there to facilitate further dialogue. And part of that global dialogue was also about showing people that something like a tree circle doesn't have to be done by an NGO and doesn't necessarily have to be supported by a large commission 
It can even be something that literally happens in your own backyard where you can pin something like a simple spike and even plant um, simple things like herbs to create a circular herb garden. So the global call also not only reaches out to uh, communities that may have access to parks or to other civic amenities, but it's also a global call that asks communities to participate at an individual le level. And that could be, um, in fact, their own backyard or even something as simple as planting um, a smaller uh, flora into a planter that might sit on their apartment balcony and then they can tag this with a series of hashtags and participate on a global conversation through those aggregate images. So projects can take many tiers. They can take the physical tier of being within a park. They can take a virtual tier of being part of a larger dialogue where people with common interests participate. And they can also take a tier of conversation like we're having at this conversation um, through this conference where they become something that is debated and distributed and reinterpreted at another regional level. And I'm pleased to say that as part of this conversation past COP26, um, the World Summit for Eco Cities, which is another type of urban uh, planning event at a global scale, is also looking at Trees for Life as another way to kickstart how communities can rehabilitate land. Um, lastly, as I say, there is this regional context and we do so much within BC. These are examples and you know your own communities and I apologize, this is uh, uh, you know, just a sampling of what is possible. Um, the city of Surrey, of course, has like Vancouver and many others, this call for communities to buy trees at cost and plant them in their own yard. But the question is, what if we were to do another call out where we say, not only can you buy two or three trees, but can you make a triangle? Can you make a circle? What can you do with this to create some sort of landscape design that becomes part of a larger networked artwork that has this benefit of um, improving our climate and our regional landscape? And that's so, so important um, when we think about what we're doing. Can we add added value by just simply a statement and a call to action? And it's still the same tree program, but now just maybe with this sub uh, sort of uh, conversation of something else, what to do with the trees. And as I say, again, I've just chosen the thread from um, the city of Surrey. They already have a brilliant call out. Um, this one's happening on March 12th to help plant trees. And so this is a great arena where not only you could be asking communities to plant trees, but now you could be adding another aesthetic layer of what can you do with those trees? Can it be something meaningful for those communities? Can it be something much more iconic that makes the park the segue of not only about of being about a space about greening, but also a community space that has had um, some further negotiation and can hold cultural values, uh, whether it's about the plants or whether it's about symbols and values um, held with that community. Um, the other thing that's really important, and it's an area that I've always been really supportive and I try and learn and, and support as much as possible, is it's very important to also think of our indigenous context. And we have used in the past in BC, a lot of Pacific crab apple species um, as uh, the trees for uh, creating um, boulevards and borders and there to kind of add an aesthetic layer to our parks and to our uh, city urban planning. But the part of the conversation is that is missing is that the Pacific crab apple is for our area of Canada, the only indigenous or native fruit tree that we have. And it is so important to our coast first, uh, it is so important to our coast Salish nations as well as to indigenous communities um, from the upper part of British Columbia, right down to the most northern part of California. And this is quite critical to remember, is that um, something like the Pacific crab apple to indigenous communities is representing both food, family, medicine, and spirituality. And it is those types of indicators that should be much more aware by our broader audiences in terms of as they visit parks to start to read our plants, not just as things that border an, an area, but to understand the wider social and cultural histories 
and to understand why they are important to those communities. So art can be an activator to, to do this. And if anybody would like a Pacific crab apple tree circle, I'd be really thrilled to help um, facilitate that in, in a park. So that's a, a private call out there. Um, I'd be really thrilled to see that come to fruition. Um, this said, I'm also, as I say, actively involved in research. And one of my areas of real specific interest is um, not only looking at things like the Pacific crab apple, but working with the Vancouver Fruit Tree Project to better understand um, heritage trees or trees that were brought here through uh, settlers and how we have this binary of many types of um, plant and flora histories that exist in tandem and that have shared histories and separate histories, but that should be re wider recognized by our public. And so I've been fortunate this year to receive funding through the Vancouver Heritage Foundation and in partnership with the Vancouver Fruit, Fruit Tree Project to look at heritage fruit trees. If anybody has interests or has specific knowledge in this area, please call out to me. And so what I've learned through Trees for Life is that the project not only involves, as I say, 72 participants, but the biggest engagement from it actually was intergenerational. Um, in Ethiopia, as um, across many communities, um, you have uh, elders engaged in teaching and learning. And in this project, what we were able to do was to activate the schools to be an arena in which we could do uh, help lead the, the, the tree planting and help learn about the importance of these trees within the community to foster a sense of how do trees serve for food, medicine, shelter, and how do they serve also as part of a wider community that creates balance. But what Trees for Life also taught us is that it is important not to target one audience, but to see it as uh, an ecosystem. If all audiences are engaged, there is much more gravity of what can be done. And so what we found from Trees for Life is while we were able to plant these tree, living tree artworks that celebrated iconic forms that were important for this Ormo community, we also recognized that it was a celebration of the community's learning, sharing, and knowledge exchange that became the real marker of success for this project. And I have a small video clip, it's very short. It's the director of uh, the project. Uh, he is a gentleman called Hussein Wada. He was our conduit for this endeavor uh, in the area of Kofela. Um, he's also the director of an organization called the Rural Organization for the Betterment of Agropastoralists. So our community um, was uh, herders and farmers that um, needed to have a greater sense and a greater, there was a greater urgency for trees to be within their own environment and for the children and the youth to really be championing this. And he says these words. Without culture, no development. People without culture cannot, cannot be called a community. So what he's saying is that people without culture cannot be called a community. And what he started to realize it was that the arts had activated language, the arts activated imagination, the arts activated stories about trees and about land rehabilitation. And as I say, it is that pivot that's so important for parks to realize is the culture of creation through the arts gives people language, gives people expression, gives people tools to start to remember, analyze and think more critically about their nature assets that are part of uh, the civic environment and that might even be part of their private uh, home environment. And so what we've learned through Trees for Life is that it's important to activate culture. It's important to create projects that are scalable, that can be recreated elsewhere and that can also morph or transform and go through a series of other developments so that they can become shareable, mobile, and social, and that they have meaning, not just to one community, but across many communities and across many ages. So the project website is earth-art-studio.com. You're more than welcome to read all of the reports that are slowly being accumulated 
from the successes of this project and where some of the failures lay. You know, all projects have, have learning curves and this is certainly is, is one that has had huge trajectories up and down. Um, but to conclude, this is probably the real key slide to consider is that when you are working in the arts and you're working in amongst partners, um, having everyone being informed is really important because it helps stage new ways of seeing and participating. Consult, consulting with the public across a wide spectra of resources is, impor is important. Not everyone will come to the counter to participate, but just that people are aware is a great place of acknowledgement. And that in order to involve communities, you have to understand their own contexts and their own challenges. And what type of legacies do they want to be remembered in terms of participating in a project and not seeing it as a standalone? How can this build so that there is this kind of collaborative goal towards a larger vision plan and to offer directions for future support? And so the tactics are you know, in terms of incorporating an artist practitioner into uh, an urban project plan or into a parks plan is to involve someone very early on so that that dialogue and exchange can happen earlier. Also to realize that in the arts, small and medium budgets that would be considered insignificant in most sectors actually go really far. Um, and that um, you need to have stipends um, available in order to, um, allow and recognize people's participation and particularly that is important to see everyone as equal and those things can be very small but it is acknowledgement of their knowledge that they're contributing to a, a project keep things fluid let them evolve and benchmark high and ready to be an ambassador for that project and that's every party and what we've found which has really been brilliant in trees for life and a lot of the community engagement projects that i've been involved in is everybody has a voice and they know how they've participated and how they want to disseminate and talk about that project. And all those voices have equity and are equal and they all contribute to the story of what has happened. So I've just given you one overview to this story, but the important thing to also realize is that arts and community projects need to be active. And this activation requires everyone particularly in the pre-planning to think about um, active research, critical thinking, time, give lots of time to things, how to integrate knowledge, what are the values, what are the, the, the aims, and the engagement that's going to be there. And so keeping projects active and remembering these um, sort of principles really creates a very uh, meaningful project that has the depth and breadth to allow communities to feel that they are not only participants, but they are co-authors and collaborators. And that's so important for cities as we move forward. So I'll give you the little update of what's happening for Trees for Life. Um, the Ethiopian partners um, typically work as an NGO, uh, ROBA, or the Rural Organization for Betterment of Agropastoralists. This is the first arts project they've ever taken on with community participation. It has been so overwhelmingly powerful that five other communities or five other towns have actually asked for tree art nurseries. And it's expected that this project with these additional five tree art nursery sites will be sustainable into the future, will allow for 250 women to be trained in tree nursery skills. It will engage another 300 uh, youth or more. There will be at least 150 elders there to help teach and give insight um, to the landscape and that meaning of what trees and other flora and fauna have had in this local regional area, and that schools will also start to participate in this. But critically for a tree art project, what has been quite significant is seeing that the humanities can activate learning, but can activate real action and traction. And as I say, Ethiopia has had a history of planting trees, but it hasn't necessarily reached out to communities to be the enablers. And so what is predicted with these five new community tree-based art nursery sites is that 120 hectares of land can be rehabilitated per year and that there will be an addition of 12 further earth observation community artworks. But that 20, 100, 120 hectares of, Ethi of, of Ethiopian highlands being rehabilitated 
is actually now coming very close to what an NGO would do per annum in the local regional area. And this is now being led solely by the community who's also planning their own earth observation artworks and is very proud to be the very first communities to show their culture, their trees in something like Google Earth and to be world leaders in this area. And lastly, sometimes projects just reach unexpected heights. Um, the National Botanic Gardens in Addis so in the capital of Ethiopia have also asked for a tree circle to be planted in order to commemorate the work that's being done on this project. My details are here. The International Union for Congress of Nature, IUCN, has some wonderful papers that I was able to publish a couple of years back that you can also access. Open to questions. And there is a series of resources that are here. So I look forward to, to what you have to say. Thank you for your time and the invitation to speak.